Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. In this video, I'm going to be talking about axon loss and regeneration. In terms of an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, we'll we go through the basic anatomy of the nerve connective tissue sheaths. We're going to be talking about what well, they're in degeneration and reinnovation, Seddon's classification of nerve injuries, and we're going to explain and show how the EMG of muscles change as nerve fibers regenerate back into them. Let's first start with the motor unit. So the motor unit is the motor neuron and all the muscle fibers innervated by it. Of course, within a muscle, there will be many motor units and of all the motor units together within a muscle are called the motor pool. It's important to bear in mind that muscle fibers from different motor units are mixed across the muscle, they're interdigitated, they don't lie in discrete patches. Let's consider now the anatomy of a nerve fiber. So we have the axon and it's surrounded by the Schwann cell, its myelin sheath, and around that is the endoneurium. Nerves don't exist in discrete wires as such, they actually exist as fascicles, so groups of axons coming together, and these are surrounded, are embedded by the perineurium, which support that and include the vasculature as well. Around all of that is the epineurium, holding all these different fascicles together. When nerves undergo a lesion, they undergo Wallerian degeneration and regeneration. So around 24 hours or so after a nerve lesion happens, the axon begins to disintegrate distal to the site of the lesion and then regresses backwards. The myelin sheath then degrades afterwards. The Schwann cells are really critical to the whole process of starting to clear the debris and are then joined by macrophages that take over the process. The Schwann cells then reorganize themselves into forming tubes called Bunga bands, which secrete growth factors with literally within a couple of days to start attracting the proximal end of the axon to regrow into them. So the Schwann cells are absolutely critical to both clearing the debris and starting to help the nerve fibers to regenerate backwards. Axonal regrowth occurs at approximately a millimeter a day, starting from around day four in the peripheral nervous system. There are lots of different classifications of nerve injuries, but sedness is actually quite useful for our purposes, and that's why I'm going to concentrate on that. The first type of injury we're going to talk about is neuropraxia, and this is a physiological block of conduction. And what we're talking about here is effectively that the nerve is stunned. It is relatively short-lived to a number of weeks or months, and there is no axonal loss involved here. And because there's no axonal loss, there's no wall air and degeneration, and therefore on the EMG, you're not going to be picking up those signs. There will be a good recovery from this because the nerve is only physiologically stunned. Axonotomesis are where the axon and myelin are disrupted, but the connective tissue sheaths are preserved. Now, what's going to happen here is, is Wallerian degeneration, because there's been axonal loss, with subsequent denervation, which will be picked up on EMG. However, because the connective tissue sheaths are preserved, the scaffolding is in place for good regeneration, because there's intact tubing, as it were, and scaffolding for the nerves to regrow along back to their original targets. In neurotomesis, the axon and myelin are disrupted, but also the connective tissue sheaths as well. So Wallerian degeneration will occur, denervation will be picked up on EMG, regeneration is now more difficult because those structures which help guide the nerve fibers back down again are impaired, they've been disrupted, and therefore it's very uncertain to what degree recovery might occur. In reality, there are different types of mechanisms of nerve trauma. We have stretch injuries, we've got blunt injuries, crush injuries, sharp injuries, blast injuries, ischemic injuries, you name it. And all of these will end up causing different types of patterns of injury. Now, they're very rarely pure and they're often mixed due to the fascicular nature of nerves. The neurophysiology that we see is reflective of the timing of the test. Neuropraxia can last longer than we tend to think and may even vary by the individual nerve as well. So I always caution it's important for patients in these first couple of months, even if they have been assigned as having a devastating type of nerve injury, not to give up hope based on the EMG findings alone because sometimes the picture may actually emerge subsequently that it wasn't quite as bad as initially thought. Let's first start talking about what happens in a complete lesion that's pretty straightforward. In the hyperacute period, the muscle fibers will be silent. There will be no fibrillations and there will be no voluntary motor activity. 
During this time period, the muscle membranes start to upregulate the acetylcholine receptors, and so the muscle fibers become hyperexcitable as they will be triggered off by floating acetylcholine. And so on EMG, we start to see fibrillations and positive sharp waves. Their appearance will vary with Wallerian degeneration. So in the upper limbs, it might be two and a half weeks, and in the lower limbs, it might be three and a half weeks. Eventually, the muscle will become wasted and fibrose. And as that process occurs, the amplitude of the fibrillations will reduce, and the needle insertion will start to feel wooden. Let's take a neuropraxic lesion. So in the hyperacute period, the muscle will also be silent, there will be no fibrillations, and there will be no voluntary motor activity. However, that silence will continue afterwards for quite a few weeks, six to eight weeks or so, because there is no upregulation of the acetylcholine receptors, and so you won't see the fibrillations. However, you also won't see voluntary motor activity because of the physiological blockage. Eventually, the motor unit potentials will recruit. However, in reality, pure neuropraxias are actually quite rare. Let's briefly talk about recruitment and interference patterns because it's important to understand this for the next section. I've got more information on this subject if you click on the iCard above. But when we're talking about recruitment, we're talking about the size principle, the Henneman principle, where the smaller motor neurons are activated before the larger motor neurons in a very orderly way. And so when we're trying to generate force, first we start seeing the smaller motor units being activated than the larger motor units. In terms of the interference pattern, that's the fullness of signal on the screen, and the fewer the muscle fibers that can be recruited, the more reduced the interference pattern will be. Let's take a partial lesion of a motor nerve in the hyperacute period. So here we have a schematic of uh, some muscle fibers, and the axon in red is the one that's going to undergo the lesion. And as it degenerates, the nerve degenerates backwards in terms of Wallerian degeneration. Whilst this is occurring, signal, of course, cannot pass down that damaged axon to the muscle fibers that would have been innervated by it. And so the remaining axonal fibers will start to recruit muscle fibers downstream in a disorderly way because it's not the normal way in which the brain has been programmed to recruit the muscle fibers. And so one will see a disorderly recruitment and a reduced interference pattern as those muscle fibers which would have been innervated by the damaged axon are now no longer recruitable. After three weeks or so, one starts to see the fibrillations and positive sharp waves as the acetylcholine receptors are upregulated and the muscles become hyperexcitable. With time, terminal axon sprouting occurs, and what this means in the surviving nerve fibers, they are encouraged to sprout off some new nascent nerve fibers to those denervated muscle fibers. And what we can see on the oscilloscope is the appearance of the satellite potential. So these are the denervated muscles which now have a new small little axon twig going to them and we see this as a satellite potential because it's quite separate from the main motor unit action potential spike. At first, the relationship between the satellite potential and the main spike will be unstable as the neuromuscular junction is still nascent. And so it will jitter and it will block similar to what we will find in patients with myasthenia, for example. As the neuromuscular junction stabilizes, the jitter will stabilize as well with the maturation process. Following that, the terminal sprout will increasingly myelinate as it matures as well. And so as it matures and becomes more myelinated, the speed of conduction will increase and therefore the satellite potential will start moving towards the main complex as conduction speeds up. Of course, the main spike will become polyphasic at this point because we now have the summation of increasing numbers of muscle fibers and as it coalesces it becomes larger in amplitude because we now have more muscle fibers contributing to the electrical pattern. Let's now have a look what happens in early renovation. So we can see here these are relatively small amplitude nascent units, they're very polyphasic, they're quite wide as well. And what's very useful is to actually lock onto them and then we can study them in a bit more detail.
see here where my mouse cursor is pointing to is a very unstable potential which is a satellite and sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not so it's jittering and it's blocking here we have another one with quite a clear satellite which is established and a further potential which is just blocking and jittering now somewhat confusingly here you can see that the motor fibers are causing a fairly complete interference pattern here however to distinguish these between a myopathy is actually done in terms of the recruitment so we've still got the same fibers firing off in order to generate force whereas in a myopathy would be recruiting in lots more motor units and motor fibers in order to generate the force i'm now going to show you a more intermediate stage of re -innovation. Here we can still see the positive sharp waves and fibrillations, but the motor units now have got far more stable morphology. They're still polyphasic and they're still wide and they're still large, but not as unstable as they were in the initial stages of re-innovation. By the time we get to the chronic stage, we've got very large units appearing relatively early with the interference pattern remaining reduced. So in summary, a nerve in the chronic phase after sprouting has occurred will be large amplitude, it will be polyphasic and wide, the recruitment will be abnormal, large units recruiting earlier and the interference pattern will be reduced. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Many thanks and I hope to see you on the next video shortly.